Today, I am joined by two very special guests. We have a returning guest with Jake Diego, and we also have, for the third video, part three, we have Brandon coming for another video where we are talking all things. This is from a perspective of um, if you've got your Amazon FBA business and you've got started, you've potentially even looked at quitting your career, your job, you are now looking to scale to that next level. This video is going to be all about team building, systems creation and optimization. We're going to be talking HR. We're going to be talking financials. We're going to be talking lots of amazing things throughout this video. So super excited to have you guys back for part three. How are you guys this morning? How's Brandon? I'm doing great. I'm happy to be back on the East Coast and it's good to be back at home base. I was traveling for a while and uh, even though it's fun to get away, I love being back in the thick of things, being back at the warehouse and everything. So I'm excited to be here. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, how about you, Jake? How are you today? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm here. It's, uh, you know, it's Friday. It's been it's been a good week, though. My big thing, got to schedule things and then get them done. So it's been a great week and I'm excited to chat with you guys again. Amazing. Okay, so we'll dive. We'll dive in. We'll we'll dive straight in. So, um, everybody, I know us three did here as well. But everybody usually starts as a a one a one man band, a one woman band, right? We get started. We have big goals. We have big ambitions to build a great business for some element of freedom, financial freedom location freedom, building a great online business in, in, in this e-commerce industry, which we spoke heavily about in part two. But now it's about how do we how do we start to become a business owner, to go from an operator to an owner? How do we start to delegate and, and recruit teams and train and, and develop processes, et cetera? So um, love to just start really from right at the start, Going back to, if you remember the first time that you looked at hiring or your time started to get really intense, uh, what was that whole journey like for you? How how would somebody even start to look at, okay, I need to start delegating. I need to start hiring. I need to start building a team. Yeah, so for me, that happened when I was still working out of my apartment and it was uh, four years ago, and I had all these boxes come in that I could barely just like walk through my apartment. And I remember just being on the phone with like my mom and my brother and being like, I have no idea how I'm even going to get this all done. <laughs> so I was like, I have all these things. I was like, I have more coming in tomorrow. And my mom was like, well, do you need help? And I was like, huh. I was like, I never thought about that. I was like, yeah, sure. Like, come down. I was like, I wasn't sure. Like, like, I know she doesn't know how to print the stickers or she doesn't know how, like which things go together. And so that really, that experience when she came down, we got out obviously like three times more than I ever did. And we cleared out the whole, whole apartment. I was like, oh my God, this is so much better. And that first time I had someone helping out, even though it wasn't a, an employee that convinced me, I was like, I mean, Oh, like it's this is not it is so much easier for me to be able to be doing other things like research while someone else is handling the prep so that was a great first experience for me yeah like Brandon mine started with you know family as well so my wife mainly just helping out so that was a big uh handoff to begin with and and so you learn from it you know you learn like well, you know, step one isn't that. Step one's actually this. So you just uh, learn. And then with the reason I say that is because then I felt like I could let go a little bit more, you know, and help have other people help. So yeah, it's interesting. It's, uh, it's scary, though. <laughs> yeah, well, it's interesting because I, I, I think um, I think usually you take this step relatively early. I mean, we um, I remember pretty much from like week one. Um, at the time when I was still at home back in 2015, um, at the time it was, it, it worked out brilliantly for me and very fortunately because Hailey uh, was at home on maternity leave and Harper, my daughter, she was uh, around about six months at the time when we first started. So she, so Kyla was already at home at this point. I was still at work working. And I, I remember thinking very early on that, 
it's all to do with your time, essentially. It's like, where are you spending most of your time? What tasks are you doing? And uh, one of the first things that I identified was the actual process of shipping, the, the you know, the, the receiving of goods, uh, the, you know, the creating the shipments, the holly bagging, the, the bagging, the, the, the actual process of shipping. That was within week one. Um, Kylie became what we would call our living room manager and uh, not our she was we weren't in a warehouse at that point so um, she started as our living room stroke dining room manager and um, yeah it was a uh, very interesting because you you go through this process of like you have every hat on in the business you are the you are sourcing in your business you are purchasing in your business you are managing your accounts and your your financials, your, your, if you're using credit cards or your debit cards, you are the legal manager in your business. You are setting up the, the business and uh, setting up your account. And you, you are absolutely everybody. So you've got to start to, for me, it was like, I've got to start to identify what am I delegating or what does the business need to be delegated first? So what was, what was your sort of way of thinking or process of like, if somebody's got 10, 15 things, like what do I delegate first? What was your guys' thought process throughout all that? Um, to kind of go back to the other video, guys, it's all about the notebook. It's not red anymore, but again, left side things I got to do, right side things, you know, time, start, time, start, time, start. Um, and a lot like Kev just said, just kind of looking at those things I was spending so much time into. Yeah, for, for me on my end, really what I looked at was what lower opportunities I had on my plate. So what I mean by that is that I looked at the things I was doing in the business that generated the lowest amount of revenue or didn't have any effect on revenue. And then I broke that down because some things require a lot of time, but they're high revenue generating. So like finding correct suppliers, that is a really high revenue generating one. Prepping items, that's a low one. Uh, researching, in my opinion, is a low one because I have an order. You can go through and check them and vet them and order them. So I started looking at which opportunities there were that were producing low or no revenue. And those are the ones I started outsourcing first. And those ended up being uh, the prep that was the shipping and product research because I felt I was very good at going and closing on accounts, whether that was exclusives or different brand deals, things like that. And then I wanted to be the one who was doing the reordering because those are things that directly affected our, our bottom line. But I felt that it was easier to make SOPs that didn't have as much of a, uh, wasn't as subjective. It was more objective. Like, here's how you prep an item if it's glass. Here's how you prep an item if it's a two pack and all this stuff. And then same thing when you're doing product research, okay, here is our, our minimum for this. And so that's kind of how I approached it was that I made a hierarchy. Here's what I'm going to delegate first, second, third, and now we're at today. Yeah. And um, I, I think about like, I, I reflect back to sort of the, the early days. And one of the things that I'd, I'd highly recommend anybody that's in any business, but most definitely from a, an e-commerce, Amazon, whether you online arbitrage, wholesale, whatever business model that you're on, I I've truly believe in, in two things. Number one, if you're going to build a business of, of scale um, and you want to be the business owner, then it's going to be massively independent on number one, you developing and, and, and recruiting and building a team building a team, because I, I really do believe that the team is the greatest asset that you'll have in your business. And I'm sure I'll be able to give a few examples of that throughout this video. The second thing that goes alongside a team is I believe building your business fundamentally on systems and processes. So that I remember there's a, um, I believe it was the book called Work the System. I think it was. The two original books that I re uh, read was Work the System, um, and The E-Myth Revisited. Those two books were fantastic. Um, but I remember a specific quote within Work the System that's always 
uh, stuck with me even to this day. And it was very much from my engineering days as well. And it was, uh, we, we as business owners, we don't manage people. It is systems and processes that manage people. And we manage those processes and systems that they then manage the people, if that makes sense. And it made me made me really think about like somebody like a, a Jeff Bezos, right? So he's obviously just the, the chairman now, but for, for years and years, he was the you know CEO of Amazon. And I believe the company now has over a million employees, you know, the one of the if you know one of the biggest businesses in the world, the you know billions upon billions of, of of revenue, and you think to yourself like, how does one individual manage that scale of operation? It's not by managing people, you know. It is not by micromanaging, making sure that this warehouse is operating, um, speaking to this individual, and then going over to another warehouse, and then micromanaging that individual it's just not it's just not possible and I actually found by the time I had like three maybe three team members that started to become very uh, if you if you try to micromanage that becomes very time intensive so you've got to completely change that approach you've got to think differently at scale so um they're the two things that I think about and then then I think about well how then when we talk, how how do you start to design systems in your business? If you believe that building your business on processes and systems, what was your what's your thought process on how do you even start to systemize your business? Yeah, so for me, I try to develop it in two ways. So first was that okay, like I said before, I broke it down into like each area, but then I was like, if I want to delegate this, I need to have KPIs that I our key performance indicators that I measure them against because I need to know whether they're performing in a way that matches our goals. And so after I have that in place, you know, that's where I start to look at ways to document that. And that was the way I really started approaching was finding apps like Nucleino that is like a company wiki. And you can start having this searchable for your employee when they're doing something that helps be able to answer some of their rudimentary questions before they come to you. Because when you're creating a system, it's never going to be perfect in the beginning. And you're not going to be able to think of every single thing they're going to come to you with. But what you want to do is as they come to you with those questions, all you want them to have done is exhausted the resources you've given them. If they have searched through your Nucleino, searched through your Discord or, or Slack, or however you've documented it, you want to make sure that they have exhausted that and then they come to you. And then that's how you add on to that over time. And that's, I think, the biggest thing that I learned in the beginning is because everyone talked about SOPs. And I was like, I was I was such a perfectionist. So I was like, I don't want to create because like I'm not it's gonna take forever to cover everything. But really, you just need to cover the core things that they're gonna deal with day to day and then add on as different things come up. And that really helped us deliver and uh, expand our stuff over time. Do you, do you have any video ones then also, Brandon? Like, are they text-based? So we have both. Uh, so like I said, we use Nucleo in our company. And that's really neat because it incorporates text, pictures, and videos. For videos, we use Loom. And that allows you to record your uh, screen and your multiple screens if you want. And that's helpful for things like product research. But we also have apps that record our phones. We have stuff that uh, called Step Recorder on Windows. That's a default app they have on there where if I want to create a SOP on like how to filter an Excel sheet, well, it'll record every single keystroke you do and generate the SOP for you. Super cool. It takes out a bunch of different steps and it screenshots for you. It's very fantastic tool. I only learned about like a year ago and it's standard on a Windows computer. <laughs> Love that. Love that. Because I think you hit a really, really important point because like as much as as much as we we know it's like, okay, we want to develop systems. And then you hear people talking about develop, you know, creating working procedures standard you know standard operating procedures sops 
But that can be very overwhelming, especially like right at the start where you think, I, I think we maybe have all been there where you're like, well, it's going to take me weeks, months to create all this, this huge file of all these different procedures and all these different tasks. And you've got things to do. You've got to, build, you've got to keep your business going. So if you stopped everything and all you did for an entire month, do no work apart from SOPs, your business is, is going to struggle, right? So I think you made a really good point there. It's about making, I like to call it like, it's it's messy progress. It's, it's, it's imperfect, imperfect to, uh, imperfection in terms of your actions that you're taking. Like you're going to be, you're going to maybe have the most basic, step-by-step -step SOP. It might only be bullet points. It might only be like five bullet points at the start. But then over time, you start to add to that. You start to make those bullet points turn into sentences. And then you those sentences turn into paragraphs. And then you start adding screenshots and videos and, and arrows. And before you know it, you've had one SOP, which is maybe like, I ain't got a piece of paper. It's like one single piece of paper. But then that turns into a manual in over months and years into the future. So I think that's a really, really valid point. But um, I remember uh, look, thinking back, uh, back then I, I, I had, a, I had a, a whiteboard and what I did was for me, when I started thinking about how do I systemize this business? And you, you quickly touched on that just then, Brandon, where I remember on the whiteboard, thinking about the business as a whole, like online arbitrage, okay? So it was like online arbitrage. And then I, I created like a mind map, essentially. Okay, so I circled online arbitrage in the center. And then I was thinking about all the, what I call now, system stages. I started to write, right, okay, we've got sourcing, we've got purchasing, we've got shipping, we've got replenishing, we've got inventory health, we have you know, accounting, we have all these different major elements of the business. And then if you go through this process, you end up having a, a big, significant mind map where it starts off with the business model name. And then before you know it, it's got like branches upon branches. And it's a bit, I remember doing this on my whiteboard. And then in the end, you've got like a bird's eye view of the business, which then allows you to start going, okay, this is a particular role here. This is a really important part of the business. That's a role. This will be the future role. This will be a potential role. And that's how you can start to create what your organizational chart would one day become. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that's a great point. You know, I, I thought about it like that too. And I think they mentioned that in the if you visit. It's like, you know, you you make the positions, you know, you might be wearing both hats, but at least when you're defining it, it makes it a lot easier to hand it off because you've already defined every task that person is going to do. And then you become an expert in that. It's easier to, to train and hand that off. So that makes a ton of sense. Uh, I also Good. like the point you had, Kev, about like starting with the basics, whether it's bullets or what have you, and then building on it. I like that point too. Yeah, because it, it's it's the the you know it, the business is is so being a business owner is so complex. There's so many things that we have to do, especially right at the start before you've got a team, and it's a case of trying to. It's a little bit like project management, right? Project management, you've got a lot of things to do. There's lots of things to do go to go from start to finish, but you do have a critical path. You do have that 80-20, right? You, you have that critical path that the, the major milestones must be done for you to progress. So although everything's to a certain degree important and you, you need to have, do a lot of things within your business, there are, there, there, are, there, are, it, there are specific points in your business and specific tasks that must be done that are going to move the needle forward. So for example, the major systems that I first originally thought about was the major systems in online arbitrage is sourcing, purchasing, and shipping. Forget about the replenishing, forget about the infantry health for a second, but if we don't source, we can't purchase. And if we can't purchase, 
then we can't ship. And if we don't ship, then we don't sell. So to me, it was like, they're the three major systems that I've got to focus on. And they are actually the, the three major systems that actually take the most time to, right? Sourcing takes a long time. Purchasing as you ramp up takes a long time. Um, shipping takes a long time. So I found myself thinking to myself, they're the three that I've got to start process developing processes and delegating to team members first. Yeah, that's a that's definitely the, the route I've started taking. Uh, you know, one big one for me was uh, you know ordering ordering to shipping. And that in between was something I consistently ran into issues with, and that's the first thing I started systemizing because. I would place all of these orders and then I would just be like, well, I've got this, you know, PO somewhere, but I have no way of tracking it. And so I created a Trello board, which is basically just like a, a step software that shows you where these virtual Kanban cards are or tasks. And I would make one when I would place an order. And then that way I would be able to say track if something was missing late. I didn't get everything, you buy it to your PO. And the reason I, I thought that was a really important one to start off with was because I have so many times where I would have the vendor reaching out to me saying like, oh, this was lost in transit and it'd be four months down the line. And I had no idea in the beginning. So I was like, yeah, I definitely need to have a way to know, to be able to know that uh, because that's like four months. I had no idea. And then also tying it to your original uh, PO. So you get something in and you initially know where it's going to versus combing through your Excel files or Restock Pro or whatever it is, trying to find it. And so that was one that was just a, a real pain in my butt in the beginning that I I solved. And that was the that was the time of like after four months of not noticing, that was when I needed to do it. Yeah. And back to the delegating thing kind of uh, earlier is. That's what I also found out about delegating sometimes because I'm thinking to myself, man, that task only takes like seven minutes. So I'll just do it, whatever, in the middle of the day or something. But then you don't realize how much that interrupts you when you're, you know, those little things like that. So just to add, that was a recent thing that happened to me. And I realized, oh, yeah, it's still taking like space in your mind to remember that task. So, yeah, um, your Trello board thing kind of reminds me of that as well, because um, you know, some tasks may only happen once a week also, or maybe only twice a week and having that, uh, or something similar, you, you'll see it right then and there. Yeah. I think that, I think it goes back to Kev's point, it like helps you point out the systems that you are kind of creating. Cause you start seeing, well, here are the things I do daily. Here are the things I do weekly. You can start figuring out ways to automate it potentially. Uh, so one example that just comes to mind that I recently went through was our uh, repricer. So we have used to have where someone would go through and look at items that weren't selling. And if they had been in stock for 30 days and they had zero sale, then we would go through and we would make the decision typically to drop price if it was under a certain inventory value. And typically that was done one by one by one. Well, what we did is we created a macro workbook that you just export everything and you hit a filter button. It brings up all those products. And then I create a macro that would shrink it down to the CSV file and you could upload. So now we took a, a task that took, you know, five, six hours and we shrunk it down to, you know, a 20 minute task, 15 minute task. And so I think that's something that's super helpful is just starting off by documenting what you do on a consistent basis weekly or daily. And then it'll help you potentially think about ways you can uh, condense that down. And then you can move on to outsourcing or just delegating that because once you've optimized it, then it's really, really easy to delegate that because there's a lot less opportunity for errors. Yeah. I, and, and you, you just, you know, that, that is a really good example of, um, you know, and, and there are some reprices now uh, that can even go one step further after that. They, they, they have automations in place with rules where you, products can switch from one rule to another based on some filtering and triggering on what's particular, what may be happening. So for example, if a product is, um, you know, zero to 30 days, it might be your default rule. And then after 30 days, if there's been no sales, you can put some 
some triggers in and it can switch over to another rule that might be set up to drop the price, et cetera. But you make a really good point because I, I, I don't know where I heard this, um, but as you, as you grow your business, there's, there's two analogies here. You can, usually a business doesn't sort of have a, a, a disaster, like a catastrophic failure that, that destroys a business. You, usually that's not the case. Not, there's no one single event that destroys an entire business from like certain level down to zero, right? Unless it's like something major, like an, an Amazon suspension or anything like that, which I'm sure we'll talk about some processes there too. But usually if you look at a lot of the businesses that fail over time, it's usually like a, a death by a thousand cuts, right? If you think of a paper cut, one paper cut doesn't, it's not gonna, it's not gonna hurt you, right? You might feel it and it's like, oh, that stung a little bit. But if I go up your arm and I'm giving you paper cut after paper cut after paper cut, there's gonna come a time where you are going to pull my arm off you, right? Because you're gonna, you one paper cut's not gonna kill you, but a thousand paper cuts, you're now gonna be bleeding out. And a business is a very similar to that. It's like, you're going to have, and you just had a great example there, Brandon, about like, you wasn't aware, and I think we can all relate to that. You wasn't aware that there was a leak or a paper cut within your business for four months. But if you compound that from, you know, there's there's a, a supplier not, not shipping one unit that you maybe have paid a certain amount of value for, and then let's say, some materials then don't get delivered or Amazon just lose some of your stock. And then maybe as an employee or a, a staff member or whatever the case might be, might not be working optimized or, or whatever the case might be. All of a sudden you've got a compound effect of this is not working to, to, to how it should. This isn't, and it's all financials at the bottom of it all. It's all costing you. And that's how a business can basically suffocate and die out over time. So that's why it's super important to have processes in place that make you aware if something's not working right. Um, and part of it is Brandon's on Brandon's uh, baseline comment is one of the things we do for like the in-person ones. And it's on, you know, with VAs, it's mostly like they might ask you questions on your procedure. Well, with the, you know, the team here at the warehouse for the prep stuff, we actually like, we'll take the procedure then and just go through it with each per, you know, with each, well, as a group, I guess, but in there, then you learn things too, of things you might have left out and things like that. Um, but it, it's kind of related to that, I guess. No, yeah. sorry, go on, go on, Brandon. No, you're good. No, I was just going to pop off. I mean, that, that was literally the, uh, the thing that made us go virtual with a lot of some of our SOPs is that we were consistently updating it. And we found that some of our advanced team members would, would see that, uh, you know, we would have a process changed by the time they would go to train another employee. So like we would have updated our shipping manuals and procedures by the time we had hired someone in a few months. So we went to that virtual one now where it's, linked on every desktop and it allows the person to us to update it on a consistent basis across all platforms uh, versus having it potentially be out of date in certain areas as you know, with e-commerce companies, your procedures change all the times, so whether it's not even just dealing with prep, but like how we research the softwares you might use, change your criteria, the fees, uh, all these things can update over time. So I definitely think having that fluidity in your SOPs is huge. Absolutely. Um, and you, you also touched on a really good topic, which was to do with KPIs and uh, key performance indicators. And I just wanted to, uh, to quickly get your thoughts on this as well, because somebody may be watching this here right now and they, they are going, okay, um, I, I see the value on creating systems and processes and, and S SOPs and, and I, I hear what you're saying, but how do I how do I even come up with a KPI? Like what does that what's the, the thought process on a, a KPI? So um, when you think about the roles that you have, whether it is purchasing or shipping or the warehouse or anything that's happening, 
What's what's your thought process on how do you even come up with a KPI that is is actually going to be useful for you? Yeah. So uh, first, I usually like to start with the end in mind. So I'm going to take, let's say, you know, I want to hit a certain amount of sales, for instance, and I know that I sell each product per se uh, $10. Well, what I do from there, and if I say I want to hit a hundred thousand for a hundred thousand dollars in a month, well, then I know I can work back from that. So typically what I do then is if I say I want to hit you know, these amount of sales and I'm going to have to sell 10,000 units a month to do that. Well, that means you're going to have to ship out at least 10,000 units. And so that gives you an idea about how many per day you need to be sending out. Well, that then trickles back to your purchasing. You need to be purchased. You got nothing to send out. You can't like you got you're not gonna hit those sales. So you have to know this is my purchasing goals. And then that took a fact to your product research goals. So typically I found that's just the easiest uh my way for me to think about it is I need to have a goal in mind, and then you build your KPIs off of that. And because you and then you have to take into account that not everything is going to be a hundred percent efficient. So you have to say every product I order is probably not going to work out. You're going to have a dud. You might have someone who's penny cutting that it might not sell in 20 days. It might sell in 40 days. And you have to keep those little factors of safety throughout every part of the process, whether it's in sourcing, purchasing, shipping. And you have to think about like delays and just coming to you. And that's that's how we've come up with our KPIs is having our our goal that we want to get to, and then the actions that have to happen in order for that to happen for us. Love that. How about you, Jake? The Well, if I go back to like the VAs and that, it's um, the numbers all build on each other. I mean, not to sound exactly like what Brandon was saying, but the amount of product source, there, or excuse me, the amount of products maybe deemed as a winner versus after the reviewed as a winner versus um, after we do some more analysis versus purchase, you know, those numbers are always kind of like a little Christmas tree there. Um, but they are directly impacted with like, if you want to work the numbers backwards, like Brandon's saying um, that you can do, do that thing uh, for the warehouse though. We don't KPIs are more like, Units shipped a day, employee hours, things like that. Because uh, most of my targets there are kind of arbitrary. But again, you learn something each time when you bring somebody in new or you do a new process or a new update. Uh, even if that target might be kind of arbitrary, because of course, you know, the goal is like cash flow and then some. But um, you still learn something each time you revise a process or revise a, um, a procedure. So it's, it's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 um, I cannot uh, uh, emphasize how important the the uh, the point that was just made by um, uh, having the end goal in mind. Uh, that that is really important to go. Where, where? What is your goal? What is the end goal? And reverse engineer that back. It's a little bit like, uh, as Brandon was just talking then, and as you as the were then talking, Jake, I, I was thinking about, um, you know, if you was in a, in, a, in a car, for example, like you, you can't go from zero miles an hour to 70 miles an hour in, in like instantly. You can't, you can't do that. You can't step change. Like before you get to 70 miles an hour, you must have at some point gone 60 miles an hour and you must have at some point done 50 miles an hour and then 40 miles an hour and you are you, you know the the speed is increasing before you get to the target speed that you're going to so with that in mind i absolutely agree if you have a goal i don't care what goal that is you might want to say you want to do a million a year maybe 10 million a year maybe a billion a year maybe a trillion a year, whatever the goal really is, what you, but what, depending on what your goal is, is you need to know what it is that you're actually attempting to do and what that actually looks like. Because a, a hundred thousand a year is very different to 10 million a year. 
And if you were able to break that back down to, for example, if you go into your Amazon Seller Central account right now, you will be able to see what your average sell for price has been. Amazon is going to give you a lot of metrics. But let's say, for example, your average sell for price here in the UK, let's say it's £20 on average you're selling products for. Or let's say in the US, it is uh, $34 on average uh, that you're selling. Well, knowing that, you now know what you, your current average performance is. So let's say, for example, you then wanted to do $10 million a year. You now know, based on your history, your average, you know how many units you have to sell on that average. And it will tell you exactly how many units that you would have had to sell. And then like Brandon said, okay, so if you've sold those units, how many units would you have had to ship? You know, and we all know, that you're not going to sell 100% of everything that you ship. There's going to be a certain percentage that might not sell within the 30 days or the 60 days or the 90 days or whatever the time is. You might have to liquidate at some point. You, there might be damages. There might be refunds. There might be all these different things that can occur. So you know that you're going to have, if you need to ship 10,000 products, and, and every single one of those products have to sell to get your target, the chances are you're going to have to ship 12,000 units, 11,000 units, a little bit above. So then you reverse engineer that back all the way to what your inputs are because your outcome is it can only be the most obvious K KPI that a lot of people look at is their sales, right? They go onto the Amazon app, what, what's my sales today? That's the most obvious KPI for all of us. But what will make you, I believe, the, a, a great business owner is being able to diagnose that all the way back to where your inputs are, what your team are doing, how they can impact that result. And not only that, I think it's really important when things are not going well in your business too. So let's say something is not going right it's really important to be able to do some fault finding and identify where to focus your energy. Yeah, hundred percent. I like it. And I know for, for me too, it was finding a re realistic KPIs as well, because something I, I, you're going to learn early on is that you can't expect the same amount of output from your employees as you put in the business because it's, it's your business. Like you're always going to have that extra drive and you need to be able to set them up for success with, with realistic KPIs. So even though you might have all of these, these goals in mind, if you say, I need someone to prep a uh, hundred products in 30 seconds, it's just not going to happen. Like <laughs> I don't care how much you wish it or will it, it's just not going to happen. So that's where having an idea, a realistic idea about what each max output is per person is very important when creating these goals as well. Because I know, and also you have to think like people work better at the beginning of the day and towards the end of the day when they're tired or beginning of the week uh, versus the end of the week. These are all things to keep in mind because I think also on the other end of KPIs, it, it's so easy to just look at it as, as numbers on a board. So uh, easy one to look at is, is prep because, you know, if someone has prepped, uh, you know, 10 products in a minute versus 20, well, this person who prepped 10 could have had glass. They could have had a much more complex thing versus stickering. So it's, it is good to also have other ways to track that, that they're prepping more extreme products or do more difficult products. Uh, but also like keep that in mind that sometimes numbers will fluctuate. And I know it, it's easy to, to get um, buried in those, similar to how we do with the sales. No, I, I, I totally agree. It's, it's not black and white. Like no, no, uh, no performance or no team members black and white. There's a lot more factors that go into it. But you just touched on a, you know, being visible, you know, KPIs, your performance. Having that visible is, is, is really, really important. It's very useful for everybody in the team to see what is happening in the business. I mean, one of the things that we do on a daily basis is at the end of every uh, working day, 
all our different teams and ha- where, wherever they fit into the business, they have KPIs that they report back on every, at the end of every day. And then it's, it, one, it allows everybody to see what's going on. It also allows you to see what other teams, how they're doing. It, that, that has a lot of uh, great benefits to that. We can, you know, you can celebrate if it's been an amazing day, if you are like really above target and things like this, you can, you can reward, you can celebrate, you can, or, or if somebody is, if somebody is potentially struggling, it, it will show that in the numbers too. Or if there's been a difficulty, if there's been a breakdown, that will show in the numbers too, because, and that will then highlight to, to everybody else. And then, then we can support and we can help and we can go in and we can investigate. We can um, uh, get some support in the area. Um, I, I think having that visible is really, really important, especially and, and more so for you as the business owner, because you could not be maybe at the work, the, 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 the workplace. Like right now, I'm, I'm working from home today. But I will know everything that's happening. I could go onto some sheets. I can go into Slack. I can. I know where the KPIs are, and I'll be able to see everything that's happening in the business, whether I'm there or not. Which is very, very good, especially if you've got goals of traveling or uh, you, you're out on meetings or you trade shows. You can still see what's happening in the business. Yeah. And I know one thing that kind of brings up in my mind is the, the importance of KPIs is it's an old quote. And I, I try to think exactly how it goes, but basically it goes along the lines of what isn't tracked, isn't managed. And I think that having a way to track every part of your business kind of brings up those points you talked about. Well, hey, if this is declining, what's going on, it brings those things to your attention. And it could be a lack of training. You know, we we constantly do feedback. Uh, surveys with our group and say, well, here are all the software you are dealing with. Here are all of the different things you're supposed to perform as a function of your job. How well do you feel like you understand this? And it helps us gain feedback on how well they understand what they're supposed to do, because sometimes the following metric could just be that it could be a lack of training. It's not always just on the person or the system. And I think that that's super important is to have uh, a good amount of metrics at your vital points in your company so that you're able to get on that and see down trends when it's happening. But also, obviously, when you're doing great, it's it's awesome to share that. I mean, we do the same thing. We have a, a morning meeting every day to say, hey, here's how yesterday went. And then we also have an end of week meeting to say, hey, here's all we did this week. Here are all the improvements we, we made. Here are how we did in person production and prep, all, like everything. I think that's super important is to, it gives you time to get the group together and it's uh, it's able to think on uh, problems you're coming up with or running into, but also celebrate those victories. And that helps really build that that good culture that people want to be a part of. Uh, Brandon, that quote you were talking about, is that the what gets measured gets managed? Is it that yeah, one? That's, that's it. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, surprisingly. I remember that. <laughs> Yeah, it's a really, it's a great, that, that is a great quote. And the, there's two things that come to my mind on uh, the, the, the um, uh, as we talk about KPIs. The first thing um, is um, if you think of, if you think from a, a different industry com- completely, if you think of like, let's say um, uh, the emergency response services, an ambulance, whether it's doctors, nurses, etc. This is how I I understood it in my mind. Was um, if you think of like if somebody if somebody had an accident on the street, the, the or a car crash or something like this, and and the ambulance was called and you had paramedics that rushed to the scene. What they are doing is they are as quickly as possible looking for key performance indicators, KPIs of the casualty. Because what they're trying to do is they're trying to diagnose what needs attention first. So, and this is happening very, very quickly. Obviously, the paramedics and the the doctors and the nurses, they are going and rushing to that scene of the accident. And they are looking at the individual and they are monitoring, they are with their eyes, their ears, everything that they're doing as they're going up to that accident. They are looking at, is that person, are they conscious? Are they bleeding? Are they screaming? Are they... 
have, have they got a broken arm? Have they got a broken leg? Have they got limbs? Have they not got limbs? They, they are they are doing this all very, very quickly for a very specific person, uh, for a specific reason. They are trying to diagnose what needs their attention first. So for example, if the person is, you know, got a, a, a big gash on their neck and they are bleeding out, that person may also be cold on the ground because it might be snowing and things, but they are going to be concentrating on the bleed immediately because and because they, they can deal with the cold a little bit longer, but they can't deal with the bleeding of the neck. That's what's going to make them die. So that's what they're focused on immediate. That's like a KPI. And it's a little bit like that in your business. Like, what is the critical things that you need to measure? And if something goes wrong, that's what needs your attention first. All your business will die. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think that. I think that's a good good point too is, is drawing from other industries too like it's maybe not necessarily for uh it's a great example but like thinking of kpis that other people manage as well in other industries like a big one that i i pull from all the time is manufacturing because it's so kpi heavy and that's where we have brought on things like the two second lean process and constant improvement kaizen things like that that are are super helpful in in figuring out where bottlenecks might lie and the important the importance of bottlenecks things like that are are really cool and pulling from different industries and you know one of the things that we do are we show videos every day every morning to go over hey these are um, ideas that people have used it might not be in commerce it's it's hard to find videos maybe that relate directly to what you're doing but getting yourself in this like problem solver mentality and being able to think, well, that's, that doesn't really relate to me, but I can see how we could use that in, in our business. One, in, one instance is that we saw somebody, uh, Paul Akers, he used these like magnets to, to put the salt and pepper shakers on the table to keep them in their spot. And I was like, well, that really doesn't, we don't really care about that. That doesn't really help for us. But I was like, well, we have these uh, Kanban cars that we use are like, well, they always keep flying off uh, when a gust of wind blows in the bay door or things like that. So, like, oh, we could, you know, have magnets attached on them. So it always, it, it always stay on that table or on the box or wherever we have it. And so I think that's, what's really important is it's tough to always know what you have to do next. So you have to be able to draw inspiration from other industries, other people. I think it's what's so important about watching videos like this is because it's, it might not directly apply to you, but it gets your brain thinking. I think that's just as important as the doing of all the processes. Um, and for that continuous improvement, you know, like when we're saying SOPs and we're saying KPIs and all that, it all starts at the baseline. You know, you have to know like where you're at before you know where you want to go or how to improve it or what's matter or what the tack time is here compared to the tack time here. Um, you know, it all kind of starts with that baseline of actually like acknowledging it. And it's kind of an odd example, but at least it's not as dark as Kev's lately, but it's like you're um, getting into the psychology of the, you know, what is the matter with this situation here um, and finding opportunities for improvement. But I'm huge with Paul Akers as well. Um, we don't do it once a day. Well, we do 3S once a day, but anyways, we watch his videos or like the lean farmer. Um, there's a UK, uh, there's a company that does cushions in the UK. That's great. There's a company in Ireland. That's great too. But there's about five YouTube channels that all have lean stuff. And just like you said, it's not necessarily in a warehouse, um, but it can all be related. So just like, I guess the other thing that was big for us is, yeah, it might take you a step to go get your tape over there, but you know, when you do that 80 times a day, that's 80 steps. So if everything's just right there, right in front of you, it's it's pretty huge. And, and then going back to also just one last, uh, maybe this is my second time of saying this, but when working with the VAs, there was a couple of times when they were sick. And so maybe I'd have to fill in, in some cases and I'm just going with like the Walmart stuff. You know, why don't we do this bulk upload or, or you know, where's the sheet for doing this, you know, as a as an Excel sheet? Um, and so that was a lot of it, too, is just taking a look at what we currently do and then why and asking questions and then sorting it through. 
This is yeah. it. And, and uh, a very a great exercise. And, and um, I can't remember where this was from, but uh, a great exercise. If you if you have a team right now, whether the, it's your sourcing team, it's a purchasing team, whether it's your warehouse team, it doesn't matter what team it ultimately is. What well, one thing that you may find is um, over time, one of the things that you do have to manage as well is um, the way that everybody works can sometimes evolve and morph into something that's not the standard process, right? People start to potentially find better ways of doing things or people forget how things should be done. And I remember I remember reading something and it was to do with a paper airplane. And um, it's good good sort of case study this. So, but, so like us three here, if we had an exercise to uh, me like build a paper airplane, Jake and Brandon, we all build a paper airplane. We are all most likely going to do it differently. You know, we might do it the same, we might do it differently. But let's say, for example, we all did it differently. And then we had a competition on how far that airplane could be, how good the performance ultimately is. One of us would be a winner, right? Uh, let's say Jake won. Well, a great exercise then is if Jake then shared his process on how he built that airplane with us two, and then we uniformed and exactly how we all did it, our entire performance across the three of us would, would all increase because we found that that's the best way of working. We found that that's the best performance. So if we just copied then Jake, we would then be better as well. And that can apply to your sourcing team. If you've got multiple sources, having them have like standardize uh, an exercise where they all work the same, whether that's in your warehouse right now, the way polybagging's being done, you know, getting your team around the, the table and, and having a, a competition, if you like, or exercise to go, who is the best person at this, the quickest, the best quality control. And then, sharing that with everybody and saying from now on we're going to do it like this and you'll find that your performance will will increase does that make sense i love that yeah <laughs> it's so funny how especially in the in the office we'll find that people have this thing they do in a certain way and that no one else has an idea they're like the the key holders of the kingdom are like why would you not share this like <laughs> little things like keyboard shortcuts or uh you know text expanders, which I'm like such a big proponent of. It's these little things you're like, hey, and it, it's for every department. You want to try and share that wisdom. There's no benefit for only one person knowing that. I think that's where it is helpful is like having people collaborate or having, like you said, maybe a, a competition or something to that effect. It's like, hey, well, this person's clearly, clearly knows something or doing something different that should probably be implemented for everybody. So yeah, I, I love that. Yeah, and and then uh, to touch uh, to to move on to the next topic that I wanted to touch on because you just brought it up because I think it's really good is um, to do with culture, right? It's to do with how you build that culture in the business. You just mentioned there about, and it happens a lot. It's like why would you not share that information or uh, how to generate ideas? Or you've mentioned about morning meetings and you know performance reviews and and building that culture is. Because I found when you start having, you know, two, three, four, 10, 15, 30, 40 employees and team, team members, culture becomes very, very important and what you want to um, represent and what your business represents. Um, how have you going, gone about this in on your side, Brandon? Because I know uh, you've got a lot of team members and you've got a great team, a great culture. Um, what? Do you spend much time developing that culture? Have you thought about, is it come natural to you? How did you start to develop a culture in your organization? Yeah, so uh, in the beginning, I, I learned really early on. I was, I was fortunate. I met uh, one of my very first employees uh, was a guy named Tyler. And he had a very particular skill set where he was fantastic at communicating. And that is something I know as one of the best things to help build a culture. You're never going to hurt yourself in a company building a team by over communicating. You might do that in your personal life, but in business, it is never going to hurt you by over communicating and making sure that things are 
Uh, you're letting people know when it's bad or good. I think that that is a great foundational piece because it helps build trust. I think that it's terrible when you have a business owner who bottles things up like I'm so frustrated and then you, you bottle it up until you just you blow up or you say something bad, whatever that is. Like it's much better to consistently communicate that because then it highlights this is our standard. This is what we expect. And it makes it much better of a relationship. And then outside of just that, I think that doing things for your team, this is, you know, you're building somewhat of a work family because if you think about it, you are with everyone you work with for eight, 10 hours a day. You're going to be with them more than your family in most cases, unless you work with them. And that is important to treat them like that. In the beginning, you know, we didn't have a, a, a huge budget. We didn't have a event budget. What we did was I would buy them. I'd find out in, in America, football, huge thing. So I'd find out their favorite college football team or their football team. And I'd buy them like a Yeti mug that had, you know, their their sports team on it. So like mine's the Gamecock. So <laughs> I have everything literally that. But for them, I would I would find out that thing. And we'd have once a month, it'd be like an employee appreciation lunch. And we'd get pizza or something like that. Or we'd let them off early for the day. and holidays. So it, it's about figuring ways to show that you are more than just a number to me. And I think that that's, it's easier to do in a small company. And it, but it does require as you grow to have a focus on that and to make sure that you're consistently making sure not only you, but your team members encompass that. And I, I think that has been a big part of us building our culture and making sure that our, our managers understand that Everyone in this company is equal. Nobody is above going in and label and labeling a product, shipping a box, taking out the trash, scrubbing the toilets. Like if they see that, the, and it really does start with the owner. If they see you're doing that, then it shows that as an example to the management. The management shows that it trickles down. Like you just, it it really does help build that team family mentality. The um the three S thing I talked about how we do that daily. It's exactly that. There's just a huge rotation of sweep, trash, cardboard, windows, doors, um, wipe the acetone on the tape dispenser, uh, the poly bags. There's just a huge rotation of that every day. So yeah, I'm in that mix as well. Just because again, just to show that we're all in this together. But um, the only other point I was gonna say is that the three S stuff that we were talking about, the lean stuff, that more or less created our culture like of course it's of course it's respect and communication but that and, and then safety and then quality but anyways after that or within that is where the whole lean is is basically our culture now so yeah i think that's i think it's important because it, it gets people engaged as well thinking about ways to make their life better i mean at the end of the day the core of of improvements and lean is to make the overall experience of being at work better, it's based, it's fixed what bugs you. If you have something that's bugging you, it's bugging everyone else doing that. I guarantee it. And it's better to instead just suffering through it is how can I make this better or shorter? How can I improve this and still obtain the same quality? I think that's a really important thing to, to post all your employees and that helps them buy in. They're like, wow, my input is actually appreciated here. I can't tell you how many people we have come in and within the first week, they're like, wow, y'all actually made that change. They're, they're amazed by how fast we make changes. We actually take their feedback because too many people come from this, these big companies that they're like, well, this is how we do it because this is how we've always done it. And it's always going to be how we do it. And it's so difficult as an employee, like stifle them. So it's a breath of fresh air to have that where we take their feedback genuinely and implement it. Absolutely. I think you, you touched on so many great things because it's it's about it's about leadership too, right? As a as a as a obviously the owner of the business, you are the business owner. You you it, leadership is 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 so critically important. And there's many different forms of leadership, but the one that I've always and, and there's 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 maybe good styles of leadership. And there's poor styles of leadership, right? So if you're like a dictator and you're just like whipping, you know, the staff and you're just like you sitting in your 
office all day in a, and, and you're expecting your staff to get involved in uh, crappy jobs or whatever the case might be, you know, that's, that's all, that is only going to take you so far. And the, the, it's probably not going to be a great culture. The staff aren't going to be very happy. It's not a good place to work. And the churn of your staff is going to be extremely high because people are going to come in and go, I don't want to work here. So as much as you can do to to really promote that communication, that respect, being not being afraid to get on your hands and knees and be with the team, you know, I can't tell you how many times I am on my hands and knees, willing to sweep up, willing to get support, willing to move things around the warehouse, willing to do things because you are there with the team. You are on this mission together. And the the other thing is to do with your environment and, and setting up your environment in a way where you mentioned there, Jake, about you know, doing all the lean and the three S's, et cetera, has built that culture because you, you want to be, you want to have, you know, you want to be proud of where you work. And like Brandon just said there, if, if, if a team member comes in for the first, in the first week, they say, wow, you're asking for my feedback and they come up with an idea and, and you, wow, that's a great idea. Let's implement. And that's done next week. That, that is going to promote, an incredible amount of, um, uh, you know, interest and excitement to be there because the, all your team are now going to want to present ideas on how things can be better. All your team are going to see that if they come up with an idea and you, it's implemented, that builds a great culture. And then celebrating the appreciation, the pizzas or going out for an activity. You know, we like to do like, uh, summer barbecues. We have like a fa- like a full family event day. Bring bring the family, bring the children. You know, this year on uh, July fifteenth, we're going to be getting bouncy castles and activities for the kids, and everybody's going to come and enjoy food and celebrate. And hopefully, we have nice British summer weather, not raining. But um, you know that that's going to be really important because this this is why it's really important. Because you're going to need your team and you need your team more than anything else because you can't do everything yourself. And there's going to come a time where the shit might hit the fan, right? There's things that might not be working in the business or you there's something might occur where you need your team. And the last thing that you want is your team to walk out on you in, the, in your time of need. And, and imagine if you was a leader that treated your team like shit or that you didn't appreciate them. The minute that you needed something, you're gonna, it's gonna be feel it's gonna feel very lonely. And you're gonna be sat there or or you're gonna be stood there with your team walking out on you. And and that that's not a place to be. You want your team. I can't tell you how many times that I've had my team that have said it might be past home time, right? It, the end of shift has come. But they're like, no, nope, we're stopping. We're staying. Let's get this work done, and then we'll go home. And and that comes from their own, out their own back, like their own willingness to want to stay and be on this journey. Do, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think that's that's awesome. I I always loved like in the beginning, you you do really rely on that, and because you know you might when you're starting off, you're not able to potentially give all the benefits that maybe a large company. Can and honestly, you, you do need all those people even more. And I feel like that those initial employees you develop such a, a close bond with because of that. Because a lot of times, if you you build that culture and you get those really great people, you see how much they care and they help you out. So I I think that's a great point is is helping build that because they will help you out. I mean that's been the biggest surprise. For me, starting off, you know, when I started off my company, I, I didn't necessarily have this vision in mind of, hey, I'm going to make this, you know, wonderful place to work for all these employees. But I was like, hey, I want to get freedom for myself. But it's interesting over the last few years where I my mind shifts, it's shifted completely because now I'm more about how can I make the best opportunities for my people. Because, you know, they've been the ones who have really helped grow me to like where I'm at today. And it's like, I really feel such a, 
a sense of respect and I feel like I, I owe them so much. So like that's what helps drive me nowadays is how much I really, uh, you know, value and, and respect them now. Love it. Absolutely love it. Wow. Guys, I, I, I feel like we could talk forever. Here. I, I, I love talking about these high level. We've spoken about, you know, building systems and KPIs and team building and culture and leadership and so many things that are so important. If you want to build your business to a point where seven figures plus, it's, it, it's going to need you to think about all these things that we've, we've spoken about. And I, I hope um, first and foremost, I, I appreciate if, you know your time. I appreciate you guys being here, um, sharing your your insights and the value and your experiences. And just know that you know it is a process of of evolution. Nobody's perfect, and we are all learning absolutely every single day. We all, you know, I feel like I fail every day, and I feel like I just trying to just do better than the the, the day before. Um, and that's all you can do, but. The, the most incredible thing after all that is when you're on that journey, you then one day you look back and the seven years have passed or six years have passed or five years have passed or even one year that's passed. And you'll be amazed on how much progress that you've made together with your team and in your journey, because I can, I, I can't, I can't speak for you two here, but I can certainly speak for myself. If you'd have said to me back in 2015, where we are today with the team operations, the infrastructure, the warehouses and all these things, I would have been like mind blown, absolutely mind blown, because it's incredible on how much you can do with the power of everything that we've spoken about. So uh, I don't know whether you want to give any final comments on that. Um, uh, Brandon, uh, what, what's your final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I love that. One of my, one of the quotes that comes to mind when you mention that is people overestimate what they can accomplish in a year, but underestimate what they can accomplish in five years. And I think that's a, a perfect point to that. And I think we all could say the same things. You know, you think if you look back now to when you first started, you would never have imagined in a million years this is where you'd be at. And so I think that having that in mind as you grow your business is that it's going to take longer than you think but it's also going you're also going to be in a way better spot than you could ever imagine love it yeah the same here guys that just like you know wouldn't picture it and then you're here but it's just yeah putting one step in front of the other um and a lot of it has to do with the exactly like kev said the topic we talked about today the delegation the sops the kpis um because yeah you couldn't do it all yourself for sure not yeah. So thank you guys so much. It's been absolutely epic. I absolutely love it. We've, I believe now we are on the course of like three hours worth of part one, part two, part three. Um, insane value. Brandon, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Jake, thank you so much. Really, really appreciate it. You, you know, you guys are superstars in my opinion and uh, you're, you, you guys inspire me every day. Um, you know, amazing what you guys have done. Really, really appreciated. And if you're watching this, please give it a big thumbs up. Please give some feedback. Please comment down below. Let us know. Um, really, really appreciated this. I'm super excited that you, you've got to this point. Um, we have some fantastic news that we want to share very, very soon. Um, if you are watching this in the future, I'm sure the news will be in and around this uh, description and things. But um I'm, I'm really, really grateful. Uh, thank you guys very much for your time. Um, any any final comments? Where can people find you? Do you want to share where people can find you if they want to reach out to you? Um, Jake, first. Yeah don't, yeah, don't be afraid to not do it, guys. Going back to, like, number one, learn, do, learn, do, learn, do. Um, and, yeah, if you guys want to check me out on Instagram, it's jake underscore dot uh, Diego, and you can find me there. Where can people find you, Brandon? Yeah, so uh, it's just uh, at Brandon Reuter for LinkedIn, at Brandon Reuter for Instagram, all the ha all the handles. So <laughs> I'm mostly on on Instagram and LinkedIn. That's the best place to find me. Love it, love it. Well, thank you very much for watching. We look forward to seeing you in the very next video. Please hit the subscribe button. Please give it a big thumbs up. Comment any questions that you have, and um, I hope, as always, you keep taking massive action 
and uh, have an outstanding day. Take care and see you soon.